Mark Meyer. Is he jiving with me? Yeah, I'd say he's jiving with you a little bit. <laughs> you doggone son of a gun, Gigi. I believe that. I, you know what, before we get started, too, I forgot you had Jamie Brandon, our Chicago King boy, at one time. Jamie and, Brandon. Yeah. One of the sweetest guys. Just a sweet, sweet guy. Yeah. yeah I forgot you all know, about Lou and I are very good friends. Coach Henson, you are, right? Yeah. yeah very I, good friends. I thought that. I've, Coach Henson's been on my show, oh, at least 30, 40 Never times. Never got credit, Mark, for the good of coaches he was. He told me one thing I'll never forget. He says, Mark, until you retire, you die. They don't remember you. They don't appreciate yeah, you. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's so true. <clears throat> well, how you well I'm ready to roll okay. on this program, Mark. L- let's do her up. Then. And, and uh, G.J., we'll, we'll jump you in any time there, too. How's that? That'd be great. I'll just chime in. But if you ask anything about basketball, he's probably not the guy you want to talk about. That's basketball. exactly right. <laughs> well, let's do her. Right now, we have the privilege and the honor to talk to the great LSU legend, Coach Dale Brown, with G.J. Reynolds. You heard from him the other day with the playful and powerful warrior within you. He wrote this book. And first of all, guys, uh, good evening, and nice to have you both on our show. Thank you, Mark. Now, you're an Illinois fan, aren't you, Mark? A diehard Illini fan. Well, okay. That'll settle. (laughs) Well, we die hard, I guess, the other night. But that's okay. Now, Coach, we're just talking off air. You, uh... You have some uh, friendship uh, with Coach Henson, Lou Henson. I sure. Lou Henson, uh, you know, we played them here. I think one of the best teams in college basketball history, and you know who it is, what I'm going to say, was that Illinois team. We played them here, and they beat, they beat the heck out of us. It was 127 to 105 or something. And after the game, Lou said, he'll never forget, I came up and said, you got a great team, and thanks for not pouring it on us. But they, they were loaded. We went in at halftime, and I, if memory serves me right, it was like we scored 51 points, and the score was 66 to 51. So I, I think you can say our defense wasn't very good. But Lou Hansen was the most underrated coach in the country. He was a great coach and a great person. I've known him for many years from the time he was at New Mexico State. So you had a great one there. Coach, that had to be the ball club, I guess, with the Final Four team, I take it, with uh, Kenny Battle and the boys. Was that the team they played you? Let's see. Um, most of them went Gill. Um, yep, late 80s. Yep, Kendall Gill and the boys. Yep. That was the group, right? Yep. Bartle and they the all group. looked like they came out of a clone machine. They were all the same size, and they could jump over the backboard practically. A great story. I work radio here in Pontiac, Illinois, and the girls' basketball coach, Coach Gary Bruner, was the manager for that basketball team. So I'm sure he's getting a kick out of this. Hmm. Coach, when you look at LSU, you are Mr. LSU, the the positive, the motivator, and what you took on. Tell us how you kept the Tigers on top. Well, when I first took this job, all my friends told me, you're making a major mistake. It's a football school. No one has ever won their big and it'll be, I'll tell you what, it'll be your first and last head job if you go there. Well, it was my first and last head job. I was there 25 years. And I think I think this, this may sound a little trite, but recruiting, everybody does the same thing in recruiting, Mark. Everybody. They come in and they talk about the facilities, the schedule. You can play pro ball, the great dorms. We travel first class, the four-season hotels, the Ritz-Carlton we stay in. And it's rather demeaning if that's all you talk about. So I remember the first time as a head coach, going in the home, sitting in the car outside my rental car to go into that home, I thought, now how can I be different? You know what? That's a stupid question I'm asking myself. I'm just going to be me. I'm a simple guy from North Dakota. So I walked in that house, met the parents. Most of the time there wasn't two parents, as you well know, being from the Chicago area. <clears throat> I walked in and I told him, told him what I what I just told you that everybody's going to say this, but the thing that I can promise you today, and I'm giving, and I know this sounds like a snake oil salesman <laughs> talking to you, or a used car salesman, I'm here to recruit your son as a human being first and a basketball player second, and I give you my vow. A quarter of a century from now, never dreaming I'd be at one school a quarter of a century, and thinking a quarter of a century at that time was in eternity, I'll give you my vow. I will do everything if he cooperates to help him graduate. I'll do everything when he's done to be his friend and communicate with him. And I think that really attracted people. I know it did Shaquille. I was with him Saturday in New Orleans prior to the Boston Hornets game. We were talking about recruiting in a center. 
So I think that was the key. And then secondly, 14 out of 16 years prior to my arrival, they had losing seasons. I think they'd finished in the cellar like eight of those. So I had to, to, to keep the past there. They had some great, great players, you know, the Bob Pettits and the Pete Maraviches. But not to degrade the past, but to understand, hey, this is a whole new deal. If you'll come in with the philosophy that the best potential of me is we, we can, and who are we going after? And this, this, was, this was really ridiculous, what I said, Mark. The beacon light to me in this league is Kentucky. We're going to go after them. Well, that's, that's big talk, huh? cheap talk, politician talking. They'd beaten, uh, they'd beaten Kentucky, I think, one time in the history of the school, and it never won at Kentucky, and the average loss was 25 points a game. So I think trying to be as real as I could. And recruiting, uh, the older you get, it, it's kind of demeaning recruiting, to be honest with you. But having that philosophy kept me in the business that long, I think. You own Kentucky at one time, 15 or 17 wins over the Wildcats. No one has done that against Kentucky. Well, it was it was because we had kids that believed in the system and kids that believed in me. And, and nowadays that's difficult. Who do you believe in? Everybody's selling, everybody is a snake oil salesman, it seems like. <laughs> but there are some of those that rise above them. I felt Lou Henson was one of those guys. What about now? You look at, of course, when you first started your career in and I really credit the coaches like you and Coach Henson and Lou Carnesecca. Let's go back a little. Al McGuire. You guys were, were making not these million, million dollar contracts and not yeah. jumping ship. You were loyal and had great uh, great honor. And you, you loved the game and you coached the game because you loved it. Mark, you hit some good ones and you missed one in your area. You know what's going to be? You're going to say, oh, how could have I missed him? I'm trying to Ray think. Ray Meyer. Ray Meyer, no doubt about it. One of the great ones. The Don Haskins. I think it was a different breed. Uh, you certainly didn't have to be a canonized saint to be a coach, obviously. Or I'd never gotten the job here, but the breed was different. Nobody was ever interested. I never even – now, this may really sound bizarre to you, Mark. When I took this job, my wife was with me the second time I came down. We went over in the athletic tour's office. I accepted the job, had the interview, went over to his office to plan the next few days. He said, you didn't ask me what your salary was going to be. I said, Mr. Mannix, <laughs> that's not even significant. Well, I told that story to John Wooden one time, sitting in his little old modest condominium, which G.J., G.J., did you go with me to John Wooden's house? No, I never met it you met, there. You met Coach Wooden here in Baton Rouge? In Baton Rouge, and then I met him out in L.A. Right, that's yeah. right, at, that, at the Vicellus Award. Well, sitting there, I brought that up to him, Mark, and he said, well, Dale, he said, here's the way I figured it. He said, when I retired from LSU, now the number's not incorrect, he said, my fringe benefit and my salary was thirty-two thousand five hundred dollars. Wow! That was the winningest coach in the history of basketball. Ten, uh, ten national championships. You put the top three together. The not even Adolph Rupp had four, and now shashevsky has got four. Those two combined are, are too short of him. So, it's a different breed now. The money that doesn't certainly mean everybody in it that's selfish, but the system has changed. The money's out of hand, if you ask me, and, and that's why there's so much pressure on these guys. And we see the the things that happen, I, I, just amazing to me because the pressure on winning games are incredible. Yeah, we we really have lost our our compass about you know what is important. And when I think of all the elementary teachers, the kindergarten teachers, the great service they're doing. Mark, they're almost on slave wages. I mean, how they can't even make a living on it. My wife was one of the finest teachers in, in the country, university professor at LSU, and a world-renowned folk dance researcher. I used to be embarrassed, not that I was making a lot of money, but I was speaking in camps. I was embarrassed by what I made compared to what she made. So we, we've, we've, lost our, we've lost our perspective. G.J., jump in here a little bit here. We got a chance to talk to him yesterday about the playful and powerful warrior within you. The book is out. And, uh, G.J., boy, I tell you what, Coach Brown's everything I thought he'd be in more. And, and tell us a little about Coach Brown. Well, uh, there's some things I probably shouldn't say. Uh, just kidding. Uh, like I shared in the previous interview, I've known Coach since I was 11 years old. And, uh, you know, when he first came to Baton Rouge, he, he was a preacher about life and how, how – how not only how the players could achieve more and get their degree and go on and live productive lives. He was he was uh, pitching how you as a kid before you, you know as a grade school kid how you could elevate your own life and those principles you know have stayed the course of time with me 
And uh, obviously, I've been very fortunate and very blessed to, you know, have an ongoing relationship with him for almost 40 years. And, you know, everything that he has stood for, he actually, you know, and said, he actually lives. And, you know, he goes on and lives that. Uh, and he does more. He's more active today, uh, retired, than when he was traveling as a coach and recruiting and, and telling all the stories. And, and he's got a whole bunch of stories and you know, I could just sit here and listen to Coach all day, all day long. But, you, you know, he, he, he's the core of, of one of the reasons why I wrote the book, The Playful and Powerful Warrior, within you. And, um, you know, his teachings, along with Coach Wooden's teachings, um, you know, helped me go from depression and suicide, you know, the contemplating suicide, to living a productive life. And, and uh, that's what I share in the book. And, you know, Coach lives it every day. Tell, uh, t- tell Mark... Uh... He had, he had a real setback. We had a little group called the Tiger Tights. We were trying to promote basketball here, the Tiger Tights and the Tiger Tots, okay. two separate teams. And these were little – we had a coach I brought in from North Dakota to teach him and put on halftime entertainment and go to schools and try to develop a basketball interest, Mark, in a football-crazy state. Yes, it is. He, he tried out for the team. Well, he got cut. Years, A couple years later – what was it a couple years or was it the, was it the same year – you met at the Wooden Rupp's banquet we put on here. You met John Wooden and Adolph Rupp. Tell Mark what, when you went up to talk to Coach Rupp and Coach Wooden what what he said to you, what Coach Wooden said to you. Well, they, they actually they actually said Dale Brown made a major mistake in cutting you from the Tiger Tots. That's right, funny. that's one thing they did say. The only lie they've ever told in their life. <laughs> <laughs> they just said practice the fundamentals and you can go far both in basketball and life. And uh, John Wooden, you know, just t- patted me on the head and just said, you look like a fine young man. And then Aldo Frupp did the same thing, and he said, just do what he said. And then I went on down to Bob Pettit, and he said the same thing. So they all said, just practice the fundamentals, and you go far. And obviously the, one of the reasons I got <laughs> cut is I was missing one of the fundamental shots, and that was the layup. And I'd go up and shoot the layup, <laughs> right. and, I was, and I was shooting these bricks, and they were going from – Hitting off the backboard and yeah. hitting, the, hitting the foul line. So, Mark, most books. Um, I, I, I'm a voracious reader. I love to read, and I always. I, have, I haven't always. I should say, when I got to college, I got stimulated. I went to college to play basketball, really, and got stimulated by a professor to get educated. But most books are usually, and I hate to say, too many books are self-serving, and too many books are. Look at me. When he, when GJ sent me his book to read. The very first thing I noticed in it that made it different, he made himself transparent. He sh- the book isn't just look at me, look at the success I've had, look what everybody thinks of me. It, it, it opens up an avenue for everyone to understand that, hey, we all make mistakes. What he just said on the air, how many people are going to go on your program, Mark, and admit they debated committing suicide? Oh, no. And I told G.J. one time, I said, what you've done is you've opened up a whole a whole new avenue for people that there are people out there. One million people committed suicide last year in the world. Mm. That's one every 40 seconds, mm. not even counting those that contemplated it. But he opened up an avenue. Hey, he, he was really honest. And Oscar Wilde, there's, there's nearly seven billion of us now, Mark, walking this earth. And Oscar Wilde, if he didn't describe all seven, do, all seven billion of us perfect in his little simple statement, he said, Every saint has a past, and every sinner has a future. Mm-hmm. Well, G.J. brings this up. Yes, he's been successful with Vicellus. Yes, the people are impressed with him. Yes, he's done this. But he's also shown why. He's also shown something else that's quite evident. My dear friend Bob Richards, years ago, told me, Dale, he said, I'm convinced. He said, do you know, do you know, do you know what makes successful people? He said, they're FQs are far more important than their IQs. He said the intelligence quotient is important, but your failure quotient is more important. How much failure can you take? Well, he brings that about in this book. And I'll tell you, I, 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 as I say, I read a lot, but the, the playful and powerful worry within you is doggone down to earth. Can't wait to read it, Coach. You know, when I think back, too, and I look at basketball, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions here. And and the first one is, where I, where have the fundamentals went? You know, what are these recruits looking at? I see great shooters. I see great passers. They don't get looked at because they don't have the height. They don't have this, but they have the heart. 
but then you see the kids shooting 45 percent, 50 percent from the free throw line, and and doing other things, and and not knowing the game or getting recruited. I don't get it sometimes. You know what I'm saying? You know where it went? The glamour. Everybody has delusions of grandeur. So what do I want to listen? But the greatest coach that ever lived, he taught fundamentals. We, we, I was at Utah State. We were playing them to go to the Final Four, and they practiced the hour before us. Mark, I thought he was going to put in some elaborate scouting report. All, all he was doing was the things you do to fifth graders. Thumbs yeah. down to the floor, young. Curtis Rowe and Sidney Wicks were the two guys I, I saw. Thumbs down to the floor, you guys, when you pass. That It's become glamour now. Dunk. Uh, be flashy. Forget, forget the... The, the true fundamentals of the game. We want to all go to the NBA, and the NBA, NBA game is talent, 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 except there are a few teams that drift away from that. I think whoever heads up the San Antonio Spurs, the, whoever owns that team, the general managers, Greg Popovich, those guys, if you'll look, the fundamentals. Now, also the fundamentals, let me tell you who fundamentally oftentimes is the best, and this isn't a blanket statement. We have 400 NBA players, approximately. Do you know one fourth of them are foreigners? Take wow. a look at the foreign. Take a look at Tony Parker. Take a look at Steve Nash. Take a look at Ginobili. Take a look at Duncan. Take a look at uh, Nowitzki. All super players. What do they have? They have heart. They believe in the team, and they have good fundamentals. And John Wooden summed it up. Boy, the fundamentals. It's the simplicity. He told me one time. He said the secret is yes, you've got to have great players, but you've got to have those great players. He said, put the team above themselves, and then, he said, every day in practice you have to have simplicity with constant repetition. That was his secret, and that's the secret to life, really. But somehow we sort of let it go over our heads and don't pay any attention to it. No question about it. And coach, Mark, by the way, I want to give you a, a note here. You were kind enough to have us on your show Make sure when he sends you the book, he doesn't send you a bill, okay? <laughs> okay. <laughs> if he does, you call me, Mark. <laughs> no problem. It's been an honor having you guys on my show. And, and the other thing is, too, now, Coach, you did a lot of recruiting. We're known for the world-famous Pontiac Holiday Tournament. Are you familiar with the Pontiac Holiday Tournament? Derek Rose played in it, uh, some great stars throughout the land. Do you, you remember that at all throughout the recruiting trail? Or? I just read I just – it was a Sports Illustrated article in the doctor's office yesterday, an older one. And I, I got I to be honest with you, I stole it. I took it out there and brought it home and read it because I didn't have time to read it in the waiting room. And there was an article in there, and I believe that's the tournament he was in, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And I, the yeah. first time down the floor, I said, get your tickets now. People kind of laughed. And now look at how good Derek Rose. And there's a fundamental you, basketball player. He is. He is. And I, he seems like a... He seems like he enjoys the game. Mm-hmm. It's a joy for him to play. He's been a true, true find. Now, the other thing I want to ask you, you had a few rivals with Coach Bobby Knight, the Indiana Hoosiers. Yep. And, uh, yes, we did. And you had some great games. What was it like coaching against Knight? Um, we had diametrically opposite philosophies. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so our, our personalities were on direct opposites. And uh, we we played him in the 81 in the, in the uh, national finals and lost to him in Philadelphia. Our star player was injured. And I really think that was the best team in the country. But Rudy Macklin was hurt. Uh, he's a good coach. We, we we just we just have different philosophies, and that doesn't make him uh, uh, me St. Francis of Assisi and him the devil. But uh, we we just had conflicting ways to uh, to work with people. Coach, I tell you what, it's been a pleasure and an honor. I know that the, you built. I know LSU with Coach Pistol Pete was there at one time, but you built a 25 year run. No one stays in college basketball that many years, and and loving what they do, and and on and off the floor. And I I remember the great Al McGuire talking about Dale Brown and Billy Packer talking about Dale Brown. And you we all... were very good friends, by the way, Al McGuire. He was a Damon Runyon character, one of my dear friends. I miss him. I sure do, too. I miss him in the Mark, game. Mark, thanks a lot for the opportunity and uh, letting us uh, on the air and also, again, not trying to push the playful and powerful warrior within you, but it really is a book. Not trying to make money for anybody or to blow smoke or his way. It's a book that people that really want to get up from the ground. J.J. Prom- Reynolds got up from the ground, debating suicide, and got up, and he's on the road now. Well, promote it up, guys. Go ahead. You got the. I'll give you a couple more minutes. Promote it up all you want. The playful and powerful warrior within you, and it it sounds like it ties into every every day of our life. 
Let me play. Let me play. Let me play your role for a minute, Mark. Uh, let me interview you, JJ, in the last two minutes. Why did you write the book? I wrote the book for three reasons. One is because I mean, God just definitely grabbed a hold of me and, and said, "Look, there's a better way to live life, and I'll show you how." And so that was number one. Number two is, you know, as an entrepreneur, I've come in contact with thousands of people, and and I see a lot of the same struggles that people have on a daily basis. And, you know, most don't get to the point that I did where I was in depression and suicide, although 17 million people a year do, you know, go to the doctor because they're in depression. And um, so I realized that maybe what, what's worked for me uh, would help, you know, thousands or millions of people, and that's why I wrote the book. And and it's, it's basic principles that, that you taught taught me as a young, young boy that's transcended into my adulthood. And that's why I wrote the book. Well, that's the best reason. Mark, if you're ever down on the Bayou's, you better come by and see me. Well, okay? I, I definitely will, Coach. I really, like I say, an honor and a privilege. Uh, you know, Coach Hens has been on a bunch of times, and you're a class guy on and off the floor. Well, and it's it's great, it's great to see you give, giving Mike. back. And uh, appreciate you guys coming on. And stick on the phone line. I'll talk to you off air. And, guys, thanks so much. And, again, uh, playful, powerful warrior within. You'll have more information about the book along the way throughout the sportscast. We'll take a break. Come back with more right after this.